Just waiting for it to go. There we go. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon from the uh, from the East Coast. And if we've got people joining us from, you know, across North America or somewhere else, uh, welcome. So uh, my name is Dylan Verberg. I'm the vice president of the NAYGN Chalk River chapter, and I'm an employee here at uh, Canadian Nuclear Labs. Um, and I want to welcome everybody to our webinar today, which is on SMRs, the future of nuclear power. We're really happy today to have one of CNL's senior research scientists joining us today. Um, a little bit more on him later. I'll give a bit of an overview of CNL. So CNL is Canada's premier nuclear science and technology laboratory. Canadian Nuclear Labs, known as CNL, is a world leader in the development of innovative nuclear science and technology products and services. CNL fulfills three strategic priorities of national importance, restoring and protecting the environment, advancing clean energy technologies, and contributing to the health of Canadians. CNL also serves as the nexus between government, the nuclear industry, the broader private sector, and the academic community to advance innovative Canadian products and services towards real world use, including carbon free energy, cancer treatments, and other therapies, non proliferation technologies, and waste management solutions. You can find more about CNL at www.cnl.ca. I can add that to the, uh, the chat in a second here. So before we get going too far, I will just put up a little bit of a video uh, overviewing some of CNL's clean energy research work. So I'll just share that in a moment. The way we produce energy is changing. It has to not only to protect the environment, but to protect our way of life. To build a clean energy future here in Canada, we have to pursue scientific progress today. Science to develop energy that is free of greenhouse gases. Science to protect our environment from pollutants and other harmful emissions. And science to make clean energy technologies work better together from nuclear energy and hydrogen to solar and wind power. We've harnessed nuclear science to change the way Canadians power their lives. And we're poised to do it again by bringing the next generation of nuclear reactors to Canada. Small modular reactors. SMRs will challenge your assumptions about nuclear power. They are safe, more efficient and more flexible than the reactors of the past. And they make more than electricity. Heat for your homes and businesses. Steam for industrial processes. And clean, reliable power in places that need it. Companies from around the world are coming to Canadian nuclear laboratories to bring these technologies to life. The stage is set. And what better place than the White Shell or Chalk River Laboratories, the birthplace of nuclear energy in this country. Whether it's SMRs, hydrogen vehicles, or advanced fuel technologies, CNL is solving some of the world's most challenging problems in clean energy. To build a brighter, cleaner, sustainable future for all Canadians. Awesome. Thank you for joining us again, everyone. For those who are just joining now, I'm Dylan Verberg. I'm from CNL and I'm part of the NAYGN Chalk River chapter where I'm the vice president. I'm co-hosting today with Meninder Singh. Uh, Meninder Singh graduated from the University of Pittsburgh in 2017 with a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and a certificate in nuclear engineering. He then began working at Beaver Valley Power Station where he assumed roles in design, rapid response and systems engineering. There he served as the president of their 
chapter of NAYGN, winning best overall chapter for 2019. In 2021, he transitioned to Hope Creek Generating Station for a role in their engineering response team. Since his time, he's become the engineering lead for troubleshooting and for managing temporary configuration changes at Hope Creek. He's currently the chair of the PSEG NAYGN chapter, so I'd like to welcome Meninder to uh, introduce our guest and for interviewing. Thank you, Dylan. Um, so our speaker today is Dr. Andrew Morielli. Dr. Andrew Morielli is a research scientist at Canadian Nuclear Labs focused on nuclear reactor severe accident modeling and analysis. Since 2013, since 2013, Andrew has been studying severe accident phenomena and performing integrated analysis for a variety of reactor systems including BWR, PWR slash IPWR, can do HTGR, etc. He has also been involved in numerous international projects, including the OECD, NEA, Fukushima Daiichi Accident Projections, uh, BASF2, Pre-ADES, ARC, TAC, uh, F, and FACE, and is currently chairing the OECD- NEA CSNI expert group on small modular reactors. Andrew holds a PhD in engineering physics from McMaster University, as well as master's in engineering physics and a bachelor in engineering physics and management degrees from McMaster. Andrew is also the chair of the Chalk River branch of the Canadian Nuclear Society and is an EIT with, with the Professional Engineers of Ontario. Welcome, Andrew. Morning, good afternoon. Uh, hi, everyone. So hopefully so, uh, uh, everybody can uh, hear me and see me. Hopefully, we're so uh, Andrew, can you uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Uh, yeah, I can do that. I have a little slide deck. Uh, should I be sharing it now, or would we like to go in that a little bit later? Uh, I think we can share it now. Okay, well, just a second here, and we'll put that up. Right, and then go to full screen. So you should be able to see the slides now. I think that's uh, right there. So this is just uh, to help along, and uh, so there's a bit of a visual there along with myself talking. Um, basically, uh, my area of expertise is focused in uh, reactor safety analysis research. So a lot of what we do here is uh, really understanding uh, how reactors behave through various conditions from normal operations to uh, off normal to potential accident conditions. And really the goal is to increase our knowledge base, enhance our modeling and experimental capabilities to better understand uh, reactor behavior and the phenomena involved so that we can both meet the regulatory and license requirements and also understand what we need to know from an emergency management point of view. Um, myself specifically, I work in, in modeling uh, and uh, primarily in the area of um, severe accidents, but reactor safety encompasses a whole area that feeds into uh, such scenarios from fuel to your heat transport system, to your containment uh, and to the inside the reactor vessel, how it, it comes apart. So um, what is severe accident analysis of reactors and why is it important? So uh, severe accident research. So uh, one of the biggest questions is what is a severe accident? And this is uh, an accident that involves a major core damage and potential fission product release uh, to the public. Um, so in general, these these have been always considered impossible and infrequent. Um, so they're outside the, the design basis in, in most cases. But as we've seen over history, in, uh, both with uh, TMI, with uh, Chernobyl and now with, with uh, the most recent one, which is Fukushima, they can occur and, and do have uh, uh, some potential uh, for happening. So we must be uh, very cognizant of them. And in fact, since uh, the Fukushima accident uh, more than about 12 years ago, 
a lot of the regulators and operators have worked very, very hard to to improve their safety cases and improve their uh, mitigation measures to avoid any kind of situation such as this. These severe accidents really have, um, you know, many of the, the design systems have to fail and opportunities have to be missed, but um, they, they can be of big consequence, even though they are low probability. So really, this is our focus is to better understand the accident progression, the potential source terms and the impact on our emergency response uh, related to severe accidents. Good. Um, also, uh, just as a note, uh, before we carry on, uh, if anyone has any questions at any point during this uh, um, session, please utilize the Q&A tab. We will have time at the end of the uh, we will have time at the end of this for Q&A. Um, but continuing, um, so what are some parallels and differences between the Canadian and the U.S. nuclear industries? Okay, uh, so uh, we have uh, both quite similar industries. Uh, if you look at large nuclear generation uh, throughout the world, uh, the primary difference between the Canadian and the nuclear uh, and the U.S. nuclear side is uh, the reactors utilized. Um, so obviously uh, at the PSEG, you, you guys have uh, both uh, PWRs and DWRs. Uh, so the pressurized water reactors, of course, are one of the more popular of the uh, reactor designs utilized throughout the world. And uh, they, of course, are a, a primary loop and then a secondary mm -hmm. steam generator loop. Uh, the BWRs are, of course, a single boiling through the reactor core and then you have steam running your turbine. Uh, a CANDU reactor is very similar to a pressurized water reactor, except instead of a large vessel used for the reactor, we actually have a, a series of pressure tubes, uh, anywhere from 380 in the smaller uh, designs up to 480 pressure tubes. And this is where the fuel is contained and the primary heat transport system flows. And surrounding those pressure tubes is a large calandria vessel, so a large uh, vessel at atmospheric pressure holding our moderator, which is heavy water uh, rather than light water. So heavy water has an extra neutron in it, so it's deuterium oxide. Uh, and this allows us to actually operate with natural uranium as opposed to enriched fuel. Uh, but outside of that, it still runs the hot coolant to the uh, steam generators, generates steam, and, and it goes out the same way. Um, in the U.S., there's uh, around 100 stations most uh, right now. Uh, in Canada, we have uh, 19 operating CANDU reactors. Uh, there's uh, 47 worldwide. Uh, there's units at Pickering. There's six units there, four units at Darlington, and eight units up in Bruce County in Ontario. And there's also uh, one CANDU 6 unit that's located in uh, New Brunswick. So very similar industry. Uh, in our case, though, we do have uh, many of our, our power companies are uh, owned or uh, operated by the uh, government authority, the provincial authority uh, through Ontario Power Generation and New Brunswick Power. Uh, however, uh, Bruce Power, who operates the eight stations on Lake Huron, is a private company. So. Awesome. So, I mean, we've kind of gone over like our traditional reactors. So. Uh, can you tell us what an SMR is and how do they differ from the traditional nuclear reactor? Yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of uh, parallels and a, and a lot of uh, changes uh, with SMRs. I mean, it's pretty uh, explanatory here. We have, they're, they're smaller, uh, obviously. In, in general, your large power stations are going to run anywhere from around 600 megawatts a unit to up to over 1,000 in some of the larger ones. Uh, while the SMRs are usually down below 300 and there's also uh, some designs that are, are micro reactors which are less than 15 or 10 megawatts electric. Um, they tend to be modular in construction so the idea is to build them in modules potentially in a factory and transport those modules to a site uh, rather than with large stations where we're building them piece by piece right in the site. Uh, the reactor technology uh, so there's a wide variety of reactors being proposed under the SMR banner. Some of them are evolutionary technologies on water-cooled reactors, uh, like the uh, BWR X300 uh, right here on the, on the left, or um, there's also the new scale design, which is an integral PWR. Uh, there's newer technologies that 
have been uh, piloted previously that are also being looked at now, including high temperature gas reactors. This is the uh, XE100 design. Uh, and there's also other different coolants like sodium cooled reactors, like the arc reactor in the top right. And on the micro reactor side, there's these uh, ones like the Evinci here on the bottom right as well. And these are designed to meet uh, different sizing. Uh, I also should mention there's molten salt designs uh, as well being uh, proposed. Um, so, I mean, how do SMRs deal with the traditional challenges of traditional nuclear power? Well, so I mean, your, your, your major challenges of nuclear power, of course, are uh, safe and economical operation. Uh, a good example here is like the BWRX 300. It's very, very simplified. It's natural circulation, reduces all the pumps and piping. It reduces a lot of the large diameter uh, potential pipes that could fail. Um, so that pr produces both economical operation and uh, safety. They tend to have a lot of passive safety systems and cooling systems as well. That's an example there. Um, one of the other traditional challenges, of course, is, is dealing with, uh, with waste. Uh, many of these new designs, especially in the molten salt and the, the, the sodium cooled uh, areas, they tend to be able to utilize faster spectrums. Um, so they potentially could be used uh, to uh, burn off uh, long lived actinides. Uh, so there's a lot of, lot of areas there. Uh, another thing, SMRs are really helping to open up uh, nuclear power to newer markets because before it was only a, a very large station. Now this would be open to areas that are looking for you know, medium sized grid power or even in some cases, smaller, more remote uh, operations. Awesome. Um, so a large portion of our audience is likely coming from commercial nuclear power where they're uh, accustomed to the PWRs and the BWRs and can do reactors. What are some of the primary differences and similarities with SMRs and the more traditional uh, plants? Yeah, so you're going to see some similarities um, a, from the side of uh, the grid scale power. So uh, I think it's the next slide on this one. We should have that. Yeah, so this is the, the SMR deployment landscape. Uh, it, I'll, I'll start a little bit here. You see grid scale power is, is one option, and that's most close to the traditional um, systems we have today. And this is, is like that BWRX 300 or some of the uh, multi-unit uh, new scale uh, proposals. These are going to be you know, stations in a central location utilized for powering the grid. And so that's, that's classically where we've been doing um, nuclear energy. Uh, provides good baseline power and, uh, and it's continuous. The other options now that are available are um, potentially working with uh, mining and industry processes. So potentially having a, 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 an SMR located at a mining site or a, a large industrial processing site. And then there's the, the option for uh, more remote communities to look for local power uh, at their uh, locations uh, with a, uh, a micro reactor, for example. So um, talking about like the deployment landscape in Canada, like this slide uh, kind of goes into what makes Canada unique for uh, the deployment of SMRs? Um, and like, what's the difference between a small modular reactor and a micro nuclear reactor? OK, uh, so basically at Canada, I, I won't say we're totally unique, but we do have demand for all the different types of uh, applications for uh, SMR. So we do have uh, demand for low carbon energy in, in replacing some of our fossil stations on the grid, uh, in replacing uh, or putting new uh, grid power there. We have a lot of mining and industry that occurs, um, many of it in remote places that would be very interested in the possibility of uh, either electricity or process heat or hydrogen. Some of these advanced SMRs run very high uh, operating temperatures, and so they are able to produce uh, 
very high temperature process heat, which can be utilized in certain processes for uh, chemistry, for um, fossil fuel extraction, uh, and a variety of other applications. As well, there is uh, the potential for hydrogen generation. And then because Canada is quite broad and we do have uh, many northern communities that are quite remote and currently rely on diesel fuel that is flown in, uh, they are uh, prime candidates for the utilization of these micro reactors uh, to both provide electricity and potentially district heating of their um, towns. So I think it's it's more that uh, Canada has applications for all of those, but a lot of countries throughout the world do have uh, similar, um, maybe not all of them, but similar questions that they say, oh, well, these are areas where we think we could use SMRs. So that's why you're seeing popularity uh, come up. It's really expanded the tool set of nuclear uh, to be able to really access different markets and help provide uh, low carbon uh, energy solutions. Yeah, so um, what SMR types make the most sense for like some of these different scenarios you laid out? I understand that micro reactors are really good for the very remote areas, but um, like going over the different SMR types, uh, how do they uh, apply to different uh, scenarios? Well, yeah, so, so primarily um, the the grid size and the, and the micro reactors, that's basically on size. And that's really the demand that your power had, the demand the power you're demanding, right? Um, and then the other side of it is with the industrial processes, what kind of uh, process do you want to hook that up to? So in some cases, these advanced technologies like the uh, high temperature gas reactors, or some of the uh, sodium reactors or uh, molten salt reactors, they can reach uh, higher outlet temperatures that are lining up better with the industrial processes or with uh, hydrogen generation cycles that uh, allow them to work uh, better in that space. Um, but it, it's it's really a, a, an option of, of now, before it was, well, all you got was electricity out of this. Now a lot of people are understanding about well we can actually utilize some of these these different designs to uh, plug right into our industrial processes. So um, obviously, uh, like you guys are coming to us from Canada, we're 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 based in the U.S. over here. Uh, what are some of the international implications, collaborations, and benefits that can come from uh, SMRs and SMR technology? Well, so I, I think there's a lot here, and, and I've got a little shot of, of some of the, the Canadian internal stuff that we're doing and, and some of the international stuff at, at CNL, at least. And, and this is uh, indicative of, of, of a lot of organizations uh, throughout the world, because while Canada is looking at SMRs, so are many, many other countries, and we're all quite working together. So, I mean, in, in Canada, we're working with both our federal and provincial authorities to help support their initiatives. There's uh, several provinces that have said, hey, we're, we're quite interested in SMRs, Ontario, Saskatchewan, uh, New Brunswick. Uh, there's also been some uh, interest from Alberta and potentially other uh, provinces are, are interested in that. And our federal government is pushing forward uh, on SMRs as a solution for uh, carbon, uh, low carbon generation. Uh, Industry-wide, we have uh, the Candy Owners Group has been putting some task force together of CEOs and has a technology forum for SMRs. And of course, uh, CNS, or, uh, CNL has been working with uh, our, our direct vendors who are interested in building in Canada. On the international side, there's, there's a lot of work being uh, conducted at the IAEA, uh, looking at uh, dealing with SMRs under regulation and harmonizing regulations over uh, various areas. So CNL participates in some of those uh, projects uh, and efforts there. Uh, within the OECD NEA, um, yeah, the NEA is always focused on supporting uh, nuclear technology. There's a lot of SMR efforts going on there. Uh, I myself actually am the chair of uh, the Committee for the Safety of uh, Nuclear Installations, uh, our expert group, I'm chairing the expert group on uh, small modular reactors. So uh, we're looking into seeing how our, our expert group and the committee at large can then uh, support these technologies and ensuring uh, safe operations and deployment. And then there's the Generation 4 International Forum, which is a collaboration of many countries um, in pushing forward these advanced technologies 
like high temperature gas reactors, like molten salt, like sodium cold reactors um, into uh, the main industry. So we, we've kind of discussed a lot of different types of reactors, different moderation styles. Um, when, when we hear about SMRs, we do hear about several, several like novel fuel types, including like tree cell, MOX fuel, thorium. Um, so what are some of the types of fuel that are used in the development of these SMRs? And uh, what are like the successes and key challenges moving forward with them? Okay. Uh, yeah. So there's a there's a couple of areas here um, related to fuel. So in general, you're going to see a, a variety of different fissile materials. Uh, in our water cooled reactors that we utilize, uh, large water cooled reactors, we're using here in Canada natural uranium, or in PWRs and BWRs throughout the world, low enriched uranium. You know, anywhere from about three to five percent U-235. Some uh, areas in the world, especially areas in France and in Japan, they had been using uh, mixed oxide fuels, so that's plutonium mixed in there. Um, one of the other areas people are looking at is, is thorium. Uh, thorium is a fertile material that can be used to generate uh, uranium-233, so that is, is a potential option. Uh, now in SMRs, we're, we're tending to use some of those classical fuels, but we're also looking at slightly different um, applications or uh, carriers for them. So in the water-cooled SMRs, you're seeing uh, that standard sort of fuel rod with pellets and a metallic sheath. Um, that's That configuration is continuing. That's also continuing for uh, some of the designs where you have uh, either a, a sodium cooling or a, a molten coolant salt. Um, there's also uh, the molten fuel salts where the fuel material is dissolved into the molten salt and it flows through the core. Uh, or there is, uh, as you can see from the diagram here, the, the triso particle. Uh, the idea here is that you have a fuel kernel of fissile material. Uh, most cases nowadays they're looking at um, U-235 in an oxide or a carbide um, form, but potentially you could utilize plutonium or other um, uh, fissile materials in that uh, kernel, which is covered in many layers of uh, carbon, uh, silicon carbide, and graphite to form a little triso particle, which is then embedded inside either a, a large pebble about the size of a, a billiard ball or a little bit bigger, uh, or a fuel compact, which is very similar to uh, a current pellet. Uh, and that would be uh, what's used primarily in uh, these high temperature gas reactors. Um, and you can see the various coolants that are that are available in these SMRs and uh, whatnot. But there's a, a lot of options uh, available today um, that were are, are being looked at. Okay, so how is CNL uh, looking to support operating SMRs, and what is a post ir what is post ir irradiation experimentation, and what is the goal of it? So. Um, one of the things here, so so you can see, uh, CNL has a, a wide variety of, of efforts supporting SMR deployment, and then of course uh, potential future operations. Um, so we've been supporting Government of Canada's initiatives um, and its national targets for net zero emissions, uh, and uh, really helping uh, SMRs uh, really push forward. There's the Federal Nuclear Science and Technology Plan, so that's helping build the framework for SMR development and deployment. There's our Canadian Nuclear Research Initiative, so this is an initiative where we work directly with vendors um, to help them solve their challenges in, in terms of uh, bringing their designs to life. Um, we have our uh, SMR demonstration siting, so there's uh, a company uh, working to uh, build a, an SMR at one of our sites. Uh, that's a global first power. I can talk about uh, them a bit later. Uh, there's our clean energy demonstration initiative. Uh, so this one is really uh, looking at uh, creating a platform for an SMR to work within um, a renewable center. So an SMR at the center with wind power, hydrogen generation, and a bunch of other things. And on the fleet support side, that's where we're really taking care of um, the operating reactors, but we're also doing some research to, to, to help them come about. Uh, 
Currently in our fleet support, uh, we do a lot of R&D services, fuel and materials analysis, chemistry support, uh, potentially specialized equipment, um, reactor safety. We can be either be doing um, explorations to support the regulator or to support industry. Uh, and we look to uh, continue this. Uh, one of the examples, and you mentioned it uh, in your question, was post-radiation examination. Now, this is uh, a service we tend to do for our um, operators here in Canada, where if they have a fuel uh, defect or a fuel issue, that fuel is shipped up to the lab because we have some very specialized facilities and very good hot cells to be able to look at that and inspect the fuel and ensure that it uh, understand how and why it failed and uh, provide that information back to our commercial uh, partners. Uh, this is something we want to continue. Uh, we do similar efforts in terms of the chemistry support. Uh, to further that, uh, CNL and the Government of Canada uh, and our um, Crown Corporation uh, ACL, they have actually put in a lot of money to, to build a new um, Advanced Nuclear Materials Research Centre, uh, which is uh, broke ground uh, just recently and will be uh, coming up in the next decade to provide a lot of hot cell capabilities and fuel analysis capabilities and a wide range of services that are available for both uh, research and development and to support the operational fleet. Yeah, so um, with SMR is a question that I've had, I'm sure many of the attendees here have had as well is um, how are they licensed? Uh, licensing can be a challenge for the existing technologies. So can you kind of help explain the process and issues that come about from getting a conceptual idea off the ground in the nuclear space? Uh, so I won't be able to say a lot uh, on the on the licensing side. CNL, of course, we're the national lab, we're an R&D lab, uh, but uh, the regulator in Canada, which is uh, the Canadian Nuclear Society, or sorry, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, uh, they are uh, in charge of regulation in Canada uh, and they follow a, a very, detailed regulatory framework that's based on um, you know globally understood objectives drawn from decades of experience and they align well with uh, the international practices. Uh, one of the reasons why SMRs are of interest in Canada um, and SMR vendors are interested in coming to Canada is because um, the regulatory environment is seen to be uh, flexible and suitable for uh, SMRs. So Generally, uh, CNSC has a fundamental safety objective uh, and it's uh, applicable to any uh, facility and it really requires the vendor to, to demonstrate meeting that requirement uh, with supportable evidence. Um, in terms of, uh, of helping out SMRs, uh, many regulators around the world and CNSC as well are offering these pre-licensing or design review uh, in case it's uh, here, it's called the vendor design review process. And that's uh, a technological dis discussion between the vendor and the regulator to really understand um, if that design is ready for deployment in Canada. It's not a licensing discussion, but it's really understanding if the technology is ready and, and what might need to be done uh, to get it ready. Um, so th there's, there's that area here uh, again, CNL is is the national laboratory, so we're uh, here as support to the regulator if they if they need it, uh, and to other uh, federal government organizations. Uh, but we do not actually conduct regulation. That is the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, and uh, they do a, an excellent job of it. Awesome. So, um, like, do you see collaboration between the Canadian, American, and other worldwide regulators? Uh, yeah, so there, there is a lot of that. Um, you know, notice I mentioned earlier the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency. They have a large initiative looking at uh, harmonization efforts. So one of the biggest questions of SMRs, if I'm going to build a lot of these and I want to put them in a lot of different countries, it may be complicated if the regulations are different from country to country. So the IAEA is working uh, with a lot of uh, regulators across the world to, to try and help that harmonization. Now they can provide guidance, but it's it's really up to the individual regulator in each individual country what gets regulated. Um, closer to home, uh, the CNSC and the US uh, NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, have been working together in terms of some cooperation 
uh, trying to ensure that they can get some synergy from their efforts and uh, look at SMRs together or um, provide some some lessons learned and some some good understanding back and forth. Uh, CNSC has also been doing that with the Office of Nuclear Regulation in the UK. So there's there's some cooperations at home and abroad uh, throughout the world because I think um, in general, the IAEA and many of the regulators throughout the world are, are quite interested in uh, SMRs and uh, ensuring that their their safe operation uh, can can come about. Awesome. So, like as as we've kind of touched on, uh, there's uh, there's carbon there's carbon goals for countries all around the world, including Canada and the U.S. How can SMRs be utilized to help achieve the carbon goals that uh, the carbon neutral goals that uh, these countries have laid out for themselves? Well, so I mean, it, it is just the the ability to to have uh, you know uh, low carbon uh, energy and reliable energy. Um, so a lot of the uh, the SMR designs are uh, really focused on giving us a broader toolbox. So we can now work from micro reactors to grid scale work that can uh, replace uh, coal plants to uh, large scale reactors that are able to um, uh, get to the idea of um, providing energy just baseline, but also you can have these advanced designs that are working towards uh, mining and efforts like that. So that it's it's allowing more accessibility for uh, low carbon energy solutions. So it, it's really uh, a, a way to expand our options. Good. So um, as a whole, like as compared to like our traditional base load power that we have for uh, nuclear power, uh, why do we need SMRs as opposed to continuing with what we've had? So large baseload is still going to be a big factor uh, throughout the world. And, and I, I, I think uh, uh, some people may be confused and say, well, SMRs are going to be replacing everything. Um, they are really ex expanding that toolbox, as, a, as I've said multiple times. The large generation will still be necessary. If you have a stable grid that's able to accept a large power station, it will make sense you to utilize large nuclear power. Um, one of the best examples of this is France. France is renewing some of its fleet in the upcoming uh, decades. It's looking to build larger nuclear stations to replace those. But where SMRs come in, where they can help out is those other areas where you have grids that are not really big enough. Uh, one example is, is locally in Canada, in Saskatchewan. They have a bit of a smaller grid and they have several fossil fuel stations in that 200 to 300 megawatt range that would be very well replaced by uh, an SMR. And this is consistent with a lot of uh, locations throughout the world where we have these sort of mid-sized fossil plants that potentially could be replaced by uh, nuclear. And then you have the new areas uh, of generation that are opened up. Uh, from the micro reactors, which we talked about for the little towns and areas that could never have uh, had that. Um, there's a way to get them off of fossil fuels with a, the micro reactor design. And then the mining and the industrial applications, uh, primarily from some of these advanced reactors that have uh, high outlet temperatures, they can be uh, quite valuable from the point of view of uh, for a mining site or at, uh, uh, for example, uh, some kind of uh, large industry to process things is that, you know, you can have uh, a power station sort of integrated into the system as opposed to, um, you know, pulling from the grid a lot of that energy. So it, it's really providing uh, more flexibility, more tools to really provide that low carbon nuclear energy solution uh, to people. And I mean, we haven't mentioned it now, but I mean, there's also the uh, potential for uh, floating power stations. So there's uh, quite a few uh, SMR vendors that are looking at the idea of being able to have a barge or a uh, vessel that pulls up, um, parks on the shoreline and provides power to an area. This can be for, um, you know, a more permanent solution or for like a development uh, area. Uh, and there's, you know, some designs that are looking at that. Um, and I think it's it's really a, an example of uh, bringing 
a very important tool to bear in, in this uh, effort to decarbonize. And it's not a one trick uh, solution. You, you know, everything one way is not going to take it, but uh, working together with other renewables, with uh, conservation efforts, and these now broader tool set of uh, nuclear energy options, uh, we can really do a, a good effort to decarbonize and, and really uh, help with that um, uh, push towards uh, net zero. So, uh, so CNO is actually planning on commissioning and operating an SMR on site at Chalk River by 2025. Um, can you kind of tell us what uh, what kind of SMR this is, and uh, what what's the goal of this uh, of siting the SMR at uh, Chalk River? Okay, um, so specifically, CNL is not uh, siting it ourselves. This is a company called Global First Power. And that is a joint venture that includes Ontario Power Generation and the Ultra Safe Nuclear Corporation, who is the designer of this reactor, which is the micromodular design. Um, so they are working to uh, put the reactor on our site uh, here at Chalk River. Um, CNL is, is, is here to support, but it's not us pushing it through. Uh, and the, the land is being provided by Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, who is the Crown Corporation that owns uh, the land. So CNL is the research lab next to it. Uh, this is very similar to the, the way the DOE is, is, is helping to um, give a bit of a leg up to some SMR technologies uh, locally. Uh, but the technology we're building uh, here is a micromodular design. And this is the, uh, as I said, uh, USNC. Uh, it's a high temperature gas reactor design. And the goal here is to provide a prototype and um, really uh, provide a physical plant for, for people to, uh, to see and understand because these micromodular reactors are the ones that are going to be uh, likely utilized for remote communities. And this is a way to demonstrate uh, how, how this technology can be valuable. Uh, for the laboratory, you know, it's, it's helpful for both the, the vendor that we're nearby and um, for us that, that we're able to provide that research. And also it is um, uh, really valuable from a point of view of uh, understanding how this technology can work and, and how it plays within uh, the market. Awesome, so um, just uh, one last question, something so I can uh, kind of slide in there before the uh, Q&A starts. What's your personal outlook on the future of nuclear power? Like, well, how do you feel the industry is going and how do you see it going forward in the future? Well, so I, I think the industry is is in a it's in a transition and I think it's a very good transition. Uh, it's a very exciting time to be involved in nuclear uh, today because we're seeing a, a lot of uh, interest in nuclear to help with decarbonization from the operating stations. And we're seeing a push with SMRs and other new uh, technologies to really um, expand the tool set and get nuclear out there to do more because it is a very good option for uh, low carbon uh, generation. Uh, I personally think it's a really cool time to be uh, here uh, in the industry and here in the lab specifically at CNL, we're doing a lot of work in a variety of areas to support SMRs, but to support our current fleet as well. Uh, we're growing as a lab, so there's a lot of cool stuff going on. And I think you're also seeing a bit of a resurgence in the industry because of the, uh, the fact that there's a, a new generation coming in as well. Um, so many of the times nuclear was big. Um, we had a lot of hiring back in the, in the uh, 90s and the early 2000s here in Canada. And now we're seeing that uh, resurgence coming again. Um, this is now because of that need of, of uh, goals to reach uh, net zero to, to work on decarbonization. Uh, and nuclear is a great option to be in there. Um, CNL, from the point of view, as, as you can see, is uh, in the ST organization, we have a growing team of more than 700 people in a variety of areas, obviously scientists and engineers and technologists, but we also have to manage our projects, uh, get our our infrastructure keeping uh, going with the IT and the finance and administration, and, and we're really pushing forward with our, our, our folks there. So we have a, a lot of cool things going on at the lab, so it's quite exciting to be in this um, from the point of view of 
potential for expanding the industry, but also the, the changing technologies that you're seeing. So water cool technologies are getting uh, developed and more interesting. And, and uh, we are also seeing these um, somewhat newer technologies, ironically, that have pedigrees back to the old uh, times of the 50s and 60s uh, with high temperature gas reactors and sodium cool designs and, and molten salts, uh, but are really starting to see uh, Good solutions uh, nowadays in these in these SMRs uh, and some renewed applications from not just electricity generation but to a wide variety of industrial processes. Andrew, it's been a pleasure uh, interviewing you today. Uh, thank you for uh, hopping on here. Uh, I'm going to turn back over to Dylan to go take us through the uh, Q&A portion. It looks like we have about 13 minutes for that. So, uh, Dylan, take it away. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Awesome. Thank you so much again. Thank you for uh, thank you for joining us again today, Andrew. We've had a lot of questions in the chat. Um, first off, I'll start off with one um, that's a question I personally have, and um, maybe we'll keep it a bit brief on this one, but you mentioned your work with Fukushima. Can you tell us a bit about the international collaboration and fact-finding efforts being undertaken at the site? I'd love to hear more about it. So there's a lot of stuff going on with Fukushima. I've been involved over the last uh, almost nine years uh, as part of the OECD uh, NEA projects. So uh, Japan and the OECD have worked very hard to, to have uh, efforts to look into the accident scenarios, how, how they occurred, uh, and really generate some understanding both for um, our own understanding of the accidents but also for the, the decommissioning. And that's a lot of the support that the international research community is, is providing uh, with uh, the efforts at, at, at Fukushima being conducted by the Japanese. Now there's a lot of other areas from IAEA doing a lot of work with them and uh, a lot of other efforts uh, really driven by, uh, the Japanese are, are working very hard to ensure that uh, they involve the international research community in, in Fukushima and, and help um, really demonstrate the the efforts they're doing there. So there's a lot of good stuff going on uh, from that point of view. I've been lucky enough to be involved uh, quite a bit in, in the OECD efforts and, and, and been to Fukushima a couple of times to see the excellent work that's going on there, uh, really cleaning that site up and, and working towards a safer uh, future. Uh, that's so cool. Well, if you need to tag along for your next trip, I'm uh, more than willing. I'm sure there are more than a couple folks in the audience today who'd love to come with too. Um, so I'll jump to some of ours again. I apologize. There are a lot of questions, so I'll try to make it through as many as we can. But uh, yeah, there's just a lot of interest, so I apologize for those we don't get to. So that said, safe operation of traditional nuclear reactors are based on many years of operational experience. Still, nuclear accidents have occurred. Does CNL study the operational experience of recent SMRs built in other countries? And I guess building on that, are we planning on working with other countries uh, as they deploy some to, to work on the lessons learned and employ those? Very much so. So uh, fundamentally, OPEX has been the, the or operational experience has been the driver of a lot of understanding and, and, and knowledge in terms of uh, large nuclear operation, and that will not change. Uh, one of the things we're looking at, uh, CNL itself is, is working with a variety of vendors and working into a lot of international efforts with the IEA, with the OECD, with Generation 4 uh, to be connected to the design and development, but also the, 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 uh, the builds that have, have recently occurred. Uh, there are some operating uh, smaller reactors that are coming online. Uh, in other uh, countries, and that uh, operational experience is very valuable to us, uh, who, to the industry, to uh, the worldwide industry as, as well, uh, really to make sure that we are uh, working hard uh, for this. In addition to that, on the research side, uh, I know in my, my little area, we're doing a lot of efforts to, to really look through uh, the designs and the uh, stations being proposed uh, for um, one, handling the potential accident scenarios that, that could occur that we understand from large uh, reactors, but also looking to make sure that these designs uh, don't have uh, a unique uh, potential scenario and, and understanding uh, that. 
So there's a lot of efforts uh, wor uh, worldwide going into this, and uh, you know CNL is is in the thick of uh, uh, quite a few of those. But operational experience, as as we know from anybody uh, in the industry nowadays, operational experience is is the, is really giving us a lot of understanding of what's going on, and it will continue to do so going forward. And um, we're going to learn things as as more uh, designs come online, more stations come online, uh, and we'll actually be continually refining uh, our efforts uh, throughout that uh, period. And it's, it's a continuous effort. It's never just a, OK, design done. We never think of this again. There's a lot of uh, continuous work to, to keep everything safe and, and, and ensure that we're uh, we're operating uh, well. Awesome, thank you so much. So next up, since three to four average sized SMRs, I think we're talking about the 300 uh, megawatt electric range, uh, will be required to generate the power from a conventional reactor, about one gigawatt electric. Is it the argument that operational and cost overrun risks from three to four of these reactors are easier to manage or predict than those from a single conventional plant? So this is more of an economics question, and that's, that's the finances of nuclear. I, I would say that, um, what you're seeing here is less of a let's take a large station and replace it with a bunch of SMRs. I think what we're seeing is we're still going to need large stations. And, and this is uh, something that people have to realize that, you know, if, if a large station makes sense to put there, it will be put there. The SMRs, as I said, they're expanding that tool set. And so these grid power SMRs, they're quite useful for potentially replacing fossil fuel stations that are already in place. And this may be possible. Uh, obviously, you have to do the, the the proper assessment of the site and ensure that it's it's suitable for nuclear, but that may be a, driving some savings in terms of the fact that the transmission lines are already there, the siting has already been done, and potentially there's, there's some synergy there. Uh, what you're going to see in some cases there may be a, a market for multiple SMRs, and the nice part about that from a finance point of view, this is just uh, my understanding as a research scientist, I'm, I'm not the finance guy, but I, I, I can understand from the point of view is if you build one station, then you can start generating uh, energy and, and taking in revenue from it as you build the other stations uh, of, at that site. Um, so there are some, some thoughts there, but I think the idea that that large nuclear is going to be totally replaced by SMRs, uh, I don't personally believe that. I, I feel like you're going to see that just an expansion of the available tools and the available uses of uh, nuclear. So you now have nuclear size for many different applications as opposed to just the one large baseload generation. Awesome. Thank you so much. So this is somebody that's uh, looking at planning out their career, I think. So. What considerations and challenges lie ahead with regards to future SMR fleet workforce needs in terms of construction and O&M personnel? Um, I guess somebody's kind of looking in the future or maybe they work kind of in supporting the traditional nuclear industry. Um, what kind of needs do you predict going forward for them to kind of transition to supporting SMRs versus large scale uh, nuclear? Well, I think you're still going to see the same kind of uh, support necessary um, that you have in large stations. It's just going to be in slightly different ways, uh, especially when you move towards these uh, factory uh, assembly or construction. Definitely, there's going to need to be some support uh, at that factory site. And then when you have multiple SMRs in various areas, uh, there will likely be you know, maintenance teams that will be going from place to place to deal with those. Uh, and then if you look at the, the the grid level energy, so your your 300 megawatt ones, they're not that different from a large station. So they're going to have, albeit a little bit smaller teams, but they're going to have those similar efforts. Uh, so there's a lot of lot of stuff going on. And then from the, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the staff at, at large nuclear stations are also supporting you know, safety and analysis and ensuring that, it, it, you know, we have safe operations that is is still going to 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 be needed. And it's actually going to be, uh, you know, required for a lot more stations. If we're building more reactors, whether large or, or small, uh, you're going to need that support staff. And I think uh, the way the industry is changing a bit in terms of uh, 
the the retirements that are, are happening and and the new staff coming up there's a lot of work to do a lot of cool things going on and uh there i don't it, at least my personal uh, opinion here especially at the lab is there's no shortage of work um to to get done and and we're always happy to have uh you know people enthusiastic to to be involved yeah definitely not too many uh job security issues on our end in the uh in the nuclear industry here so um i'll try and capture a couple more quick we are getting close to the time here so will spent fuel from these reactors meet the existing waste acceptance criteria for high level waste disposal at existing facilities so they're talking about tgrs here i know there aren't too many that are kind of licensed or well there aren't i think maybe just the one in uh in uh scandinavia but i'll, I'll hand this one over to you well I, this might actually be better answered by your side, but uh, I, I will say that uh, a lot of the SMR vendors, they are considering the back end. So they they are looking to make sure that their, their fuel will be able to um, end up in the same kind of deep geologic repositories, or in some cases, they're actually working to reduce that issue. Uh, I know both uh, the Moltex design and potentially the ARC design, they're looking at, uh, uh, you know, the potential for utilizing uh, recycled spent fuel. Uh, there's also a lot of that uh, being looked at in the large reactor case because uh, as we as we get closer to um, uh, utilizing different spectrums of reactors, you potentially can uh, much more easily recycle fuel. But the the issue that you have is really a continuous one for nuclear and I think we are working very hard at it uh, on a on a variety of ways uh, to ensure that any operations will be uh, done safely and the, the waste issue is well managed and I think it's very well managed now and will continue to to do so uh, in the future because really that's one of the major areas of our um, our industry we always consider from 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 you know, cradle to grave, as they say. So we, we, we start from the beginning and we, we actually consider to the full end. And we've been doing that for uh, the whole uh, life cycle of, of nuclear operations so far. And we will continue to do that with us Mars. Yeah, awesome. I, I will add in, I, yeah, I did go to a, uh, a conference back in November. It was an OECD NEA conference on spent fuel. And yeah, that's really the hot topic right now is being able to reprocess and recycle a lot of these fuels. And yeah, we're considering the the waste management at the end portion here. Not an expert myself, but uh, yeah, it's, it's really interesting seeing all the discussion going on there with uh, spent fuel. Um, we are at 12.59. Um, I do apologize. I know there's been a lot of interesting questions from everybody. So um, if uh, if they do want to reach out, um, they can reach out to maybe communications at cnl.ca if, uh, if they do have any other burning questions. And again, I did put the links to CNL social media on uh, on the chat here. So if you do want to reach out or learn more about some of the work that we do, um, Andrew's teams or some of the other teams that we have here, uh, clean energy research is just one kind of piece of the puzzle here at the Nuclear Labs. So thank you again for uh, joining us today, Andrew. I, I'm sure everybody learned a lot today. Um, thank you for co-hosting with me today, Meninder. It's been awesome having you and it's been great working together with uh, PSEG on this. And we'd love to have some more of these types of events in the future. Thanks again for all of our guests here today for joining us. Uh, well, we're hoping to do more of these types of events, spotlighting some of the really cool work that we do here at the labs in the future. So thank you again. Um, I'll, uh, I'll hand it off there. So thank you. Have a great day, everyone.